します。Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the honor of televising the cranial vertebral junction surgery、uh, webinar put together by、uh, Oscar Alves, MD, a neurosurgeon from Porto, Portugal. And I'll introduce Oscar. Welcome, Oscar. It's all yours. Thank you, John,、uh, for hosting、uh, the webinar. So I'm Oscar、uh, Alves from Porto, Portugal. You know, I would like to thank everybody, friends and colleagues,、uh, and welcome you to the first、uh, CSRS、uh, webinar. You know that、uh, 2020 has been a very deceiving year for for congresses, and this leads to a change in medical education paradigm.、Uh, we are mutilated from our annual congress and cadaver labs, so we embrace this new form of、uh, med- medical education. Here it is, our first webinar. We chose the topic on on craniovertebral junction surgery, hosted by Philip Bancel and, and myself. We are very proud and honored to have on board two very distinguished uh, faculty, uh, such as Bernard George and the、uh, two Goel. In my mind, and I think for everybody, the two most、uh, important innovators in, in craniovertebral junction surgery in the in the history of neurosurgery. We have also case that we'll present and discuss, and I have on board.、Uh, Juno Li from South Korea, Luis Carelli from Brazil, and Zhang Shen from China.、Uh, we have prepared the polling system, so、uh, we are presenting the case and stopping to make questions that、uh, all the participants can can vote. We hope this will be more attractive. Of course, we can welcome also questions from from、uh, from you on the chat or by raising your hand. So I will really now start with with.、Uh, With Bernard George、uh, is going to present a lecture as honored guest lecture on on anterolateral approach for for cranial vertebral junction tumors.、Uh, professor George, he doesn't need any pr- special presentation. He was a professor of neurosurgery at、uh, La Riboisière in in Paris.、Uh, he was the Oliver Cronin Award. For those who don't know what it is, Oliver Cronin Award is the novel the novel of of neurosurgery. Uh, and basically, he's Mr. Vertebral Artery Man. You know, till today, he's one of the surgeons with the last,、uh, largest experience for foramen magnum and jugular foramen tumors. And if I'm allowed to make a more、uh, personal remark, I work、uh, two years in the, in the late 90s in Paris as his assistant professor, and and it was I learned a lot from him as a very skilled surgeon, very fair person. And、uh, actually, what I l- learned from him was to to lose the, the fear. You know,、uh, he taught me that with 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 some knowledge of the pathology of the surgical anatomy, a good surgical technique, everything can be approached in the brain and with with excellent results. So, Bernard,、uh, uh, I hand up and and to you the presentation. Could you please、uh, share your screen? Please. Okay, hello everybody. I'm very、uh, glad to participate in this webinar. This is my first experience, and、um, it's a nice、uh, things during my confinement in Paris. I must thank、uh, Oscar Alves for this fine organization, and John Bennett also, of course.、Um, my topic is about bone tumors of the craniocervical junction, and、uh, in. in The problem of the craniocervical junction tumor is that first to identify the pathology, which may be a very difficult problem, because it's often difficult to、uh, even say if this tumor is benign, malignant, and don't forget that it can be also a pseudo tumor. Second problem is to define the objectives. That means should I resect totally or partially this lesion? Or do, do do we need just a decompression? And the last problem is always to evaluate if there is a need for fixation. And the third problem is to choose the best technique to achieve the objective that you have、uh, defined before, and also to restore the stability in case there is one instability. To identify the pathology, you need a, a scanner, a CT scan, an MRI, and sometimes a biopsy. To define the objectives, it means to appreciate the extension into the bone, into the subcutaneous tumor around the bone, 
to the dura, to the vessel, and especially to the vertebral artery. You must appreciate also the vascularization that may need sometimes embolization. There is generally no need for angiography, but sometimes in hypervascularized lesion, you may ask for embolization, also for balloon occlusion test, in case you want to, or you anticipate you will need to occlude the vertebral artery. For the stability, you need dynamic X-rays, and then you decide if you are going to do a, a partial, a radical resection, or just a decompression. The best technique, anterolateral approach, posterior lateral approach, endoscopy. And never forget that it may, use, may be useful to ask for a complementary treatment that may be chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Tumor, they are all originating from the cell which are in, uh, in, the, in the bone, osteoblast, chondroblast, osteoplast, fibroblast, and the other cell. cell. And you may have benign tumor originating from this type of cell or malignant tumor. And then uh, the frequency of the tumor, cordoma, and especially at the level of the craniosophical junction, are the most common type of tumor that you may observe. Then you may have sarcoma. This is the series in which we have excluded the cordoma. You may have metastasis and benign tumors are much less frequent. So come back to the identify the pathology. This is very likely a chordoma. T in ESO or hypointense in T1, hyperintense in T2, and heterogeneous, well-defined. There are only one type of tumor in, in which you can say it is and a steroid osteoma. The aspect is an idus inside the cavity. This is the only one tumor you can see. I'm sure it is an steroid osteoma. But you must be aware that this very little tumor giving only pain may turn to be a, an osteoblastoma. This is the, the same. Could you remove that? This is the, the evolution of the tumor after five years. You see this tumor is completely different and the prognosis is completely different. Then some cases of, of osteochondroma, you may be sure, for instance, this tumor is just centered on the C1, C2 joint. Fibrous dysplasia is just a modification of the size and the aspect of the bone. And you may be almost sure that this is a fibrous dysplasia. I cannot progress. Okay, this is another example of fibrous dysplasia with uh, a swelling in sort of uh, the lamina of C2. This is another case. This is the operative view. You have the vertebral artery transposed posteriorly. This is the body of C2. Then you have many aspects of tumor in which you cannot say. On this slide, you can say this looks like a chordoma, but this aspect of the bone is not for a chordoma. This is an example of a sarcoma. You see the uh, embedding of the vertebral artery on this side, almost completely embedded on the other side. This was a sarcoma, highly vascularized. Uh, you can see that you can look at the little uh, vertebral artery, but not the, 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 the dominant one. These are three examples of metastasis, lung cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer again. This is a very rare tumor. This is plastocytoma. It looks like uh, an anorismosis with large cavities inside the bone. This has been referred to me with a diagnosis of meningioma, but it, it is not. You see the sickening of the ligament anterior to the uh, uh, odontoid and posterior with this uh, panus, which is here very large and compressing the spinal cord. These are two, two examples, three examples, sorry, of uh, 
a pseudo tumor, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but with a synovulsis compressing the spinal cord. This, this is another case of just panis, no synovulsis in this case. Uh, then bony malformation may look like a tumor, but the diagnosis is very simple, in fact. Uh, it's a sort of uh, supplementary condyle, which uh, uh, not really compress the spinal cord, but compress the vertebral artery. And uh, this is the end result. This is an infarction into the cerebellum. This is another example. This is this case with the compression of the vertebral ar artery at the level of C1, C2. Uh, sorry, this is an intermittent compression of the vertebral artery. When the patient is rotating his head, uh, he, he has uh, attacks of uh, collapsing or uh, different things. This is very interesting. If you look at this, you may say this is a chordoma. This is, a, I don't know. This is, I don't know too. And this is a tuberculosis. And obviously the uh, strategy will be completely different. Just for uh, make you understand uh, this difficulty to diagnose the type of tumor. So it's a sort of quiz. If you remember, this is a metastasis. If you remember, this is a tuberculosis. And this, it looks like a malignant tumor with a rupture of the cortical bone. And this is a very benign tumor. This is an aneurysmal cyst. And this uh, tumor looks like an aneurysmal cyst with cavity inside the, the, bo the bone, uh, the joint of C1. And in fact, that, it is an histiocytosis. Again, we have seen these pictures already. This is a plasmocytoma. And this huge tumor extending outside the bone uh, seems very invasive and very malignant. It is also, again, an aneurysmal cyst. Then the two last diagnoses are very simple. This is obviously a, a bone malformation. And this is a spondylosis. Okay, let's uh, see the strategy that uh, you may uh, propose in the different cases. This is also a spondylosis, a spondylotic change of the joint C1, C2. There is no compression. We first did a biopsy. There, there was no need for resection, no need for decompression, maybe a need for fixation, but in this case, it was not necessary. This case needs a decompression, obviously. This is pseudo tumor, you remember. This is a synovulsis, again the same. And in this case, you need a decompression, but very often you need also a fixation. This is also a very tricky case. This is a tuberculosis. And to have the diagnosis, there was a very simple fact. First, to perform a lung x ray, you see. There is something wrong, and we did a biopsy through the mouth of the patient, and we had the diagnosis. And we had just a fixation, but as you can see, there is a, an obvious instability. In this case, you have seen already the patient refused any surgery, and so we did a vertebroplasty after having done a biopsy. It was a giant cell tumor, and the patient is okay for many years now after this. Okay, if you need a surgical resection, you have uh, several different approach possible. Posterior approach that you may enlarge by the posterior lateral approach, the anterior lateral approach, and the anterior approach. In the past, it was transol, today it's endoscopic, endonasal approach. The key point is the vertebral artery. So you must be aware that an atretic vertebral artery cannot always be occluded. This one, you can do it. This one, you can do it. This is an atretic, this is an hypoplastic. This one is an atretic ending at the occipital artery. You can do what you want. But this one is ending at the pica. If you occlude this artery, you will have 
an infarction into the cerebellum. You must be aware of uh, many variations and anomalies, anomalies, anomalies at the level of the craniosurgical junction, like this duplication of the vertebral artery. Okay, posterior lateral approach is taking advantage of the fact that the joint C0, C1, C1, C2 are much more anteriorly located than C3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so if you extend your posterior approach that ends at this level, you go up to the, to the joint, the joint is almost in front of the neuraxis. So you can work from laterally in many, uh, in the anterior aspect of the, um, of, of the canal as, at this level. Uh, okay, this is uh, just a kind of a dissection. This is surgery. The white line is midline. This is lamina of C1, lamina of C2. Normally you end the laminectomy at this level. And if you extend your approach in the row of the vertebral artery, this is the vertebral artery. And uh, you can uh, remove the bone and then you have in front of you the occipital condyle, the vertebral artery, the C1 joint, the C2 nerve and the C2 lamina. Okay, you may use it for a tumor like this, which is better approach from posteriorly. You control the same way the vertebral artery, but we ask for a normalization uh, before the surgery. You can treat uh, this bony malformation from posteriorly. This is the dura, the dural sac, sorry. This is the uh, vertebral artery, sorry. This, this is on the other side, the bone of this malformation that you can see very well. This is C2 root. Okay, the anterolateral approach, you can remove extensively C1 and C2. The, the limit is the vertebral artery on the other side. And so now we need an endoscopy and we have done that many times. That means to attack the, two, the tumor from this side and then use the endoscope to control the vertebral artery on the other side. Okay, this is a video that may help you to understand. This is a cordoma, you see the extension of this uh, tumor. You see, it, it was invading the vertebral artery. The patient is supine. The incision followed the mastoid muscle. Then you have to open the field between the jugular vein and the mastoid, the mastoid muscle. And then you remove the fat to retract this, the, ele the eleven nerve. Then you cut all the little muscle attached to the, the tip of the transverse process of C1. You look for the entrance of the vertebral artery into the C1 foramen. And so we don't see very well yet, but this is the vertebral, not this behind. This is the vertebral artery. The loop or the, co the corner is there. Then we remove the tumor along the bone and we fi finally find the vertebral artery above the, verte the, the, the groove of the C1 vertebra. And so you have the loop of the vertebral artery completely up to the foramen magnum. And so you can transpose the vertebral artery and in front of you, you have C0, C1, C2 joint. And then, then you are safe. You can do what you want. Remove all the bone involved by the tumor in front of you. The tumor before the, the, the bone, behind the basal longus coli, longus capitis. You can remove the odontoid. You can even extend the CC3 transverse foramen so you can transpose better the vertebral artery. And at the end, you see the dura in the depths. Okay, this is the limit without the endoscope. You see the odontoid, you see the C, C1, C2 joint. And here again, you have the, tip, the uh, anterior arch of atlas, the lower clivus and this tumor can be removed extensively. Now again, I can say that we can go further and even go to the, the opposite vertebra. This case needs the fixation, obviously. Uh, this is just example to uh, show you the technique. The patient is supine, incision follow the medial aspect 
of the sternomastoid muscle to the mastoid and along the, the occipital crest. You, you open the field between jugular vein and stern, sternomastoid muscle detach from the bone. You control the, the eleven nerve and you retract it with the fat that cover the, 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 the depths of the field. This is a surgery, you see the, the eleven nerve, the sternomastoid muscle and jugular vein. This is the tip of the transverse process of C1. And then you can control the vertebral artery. If you open completely the transverse foramen of C1, you can transpose the vertebral artery and have a direct access. This is the cartilaginous bone of C2. This is the occipital condyle. There was the, uh, the case of um, aneurysmal cyst. And you see that's on the cadaver when you transpose the vertebral artery. You have C0, C1, C2 joint. You can extend your approach to C3 if you need. You can extend your approach to the jugular bulb if you need also. This is jugular vein. This is sigmoid sinus. In between you have the jugular bulb. This is the loop of the vertebral artery, posterior artery at last. And this is a surgery, the same, the loop of the vertebral artery, the jugular vein, the sigmoid sinus, in between the, the jugular bulb. Uh, you may better understand if you follow this uh, MRI. This is C2, this is C1, this is C0, this is jugular tubercle. You can follow the jugular vein here up to the jugular bulb. You can follow the vertebral artery up to C2, then up to C1. And you can see that this corner inside the foramen of, C, of C1 is just below the jugular foramen. In this case, there was a, a neurin around the opposite side. This is an example in which uh, you may need this sort of extension of the approach. You see this tumor, it's a chordoma. This is C1, this is the condyle, which is invaded partially by the tumor. Jugular tubercle is destroyed, and there is an extension into the jugular foramen. This is the approach, the vertebral artery between C1 and C2, the posterior aspect of the transverse foramen of C1, vertebral artery above C1, then the loop of the vertebral artery completely uh, dissected out and then transposed. So you have the sigmoid sinus now, the jugular vein, and in between this is the tumor. And this is at the end of the resection of the tumor. Okay, another example in which you can see that the tumor extends beyond the, the midline. I need to go very far. This is what you can get after the section. This is the loop of the vertebral artery, the dura of the cerebellum, the dura in front of C1, C, C0. This is the body of C2. This is just before transposition. You have the bone covering the tumor. Uh, in some, some cases of rheumatoid arthritis, after decompression, resection of this, we had an empty hole that we fill with a bone graft. And so that uh, we don't do that in many cases, but you can avoid the, the fixation, the posterior fixation, and you do everything in the same approach. Uh, this is case very simple. You have just to follow the tumor using the corridor given by the tumor to remove it. This is a tumor which probably will be operated by uh, endoscopy today, but at that time, it's uh, something like 15 years ago, we did a bilateral, anterolateral approach to get this result. And of course, this patient need a posterior fixation. This is the case. Okay, just example this one, you have seen it already. This is a transposition of the vertebral artery, cartilaginous split of C2 for this aneurysmal cyst that was taken as a sarcoma and it was almost sent to radiotherapy without any biopsy because they were afraid to make a biopsy uh, with the vertebral artery just nearby. This is an example of a metastasis involving the condyle, this is after the resection. You see the preservation of the normal bone. Now, just a few words about endoscopy. This may help the, the anterolateral approach 
uh, all the apples, so do it's a sort of combination. This is a chordoma. You see the extension. This with the anterior lateral approach. This is an intra -dural. With the anterior lateral approach, it's not an easy game to find, to, to get to it and to remove it. So we, we remove this with the anterior lateral approach. Then with an endoscope, 30 degrees, you can get the, the intra -dural extension. This is post-operative. You see there is no more extension here. This is fat. And you may use only endoscope or endonasal endoscopic approach for tumor. As I said, you see this uh, chordoma almost on the midline, just ex extending towards the vertebral artery. This is the patient with the record of the 12th nerve. And you will see uh, what you can get just with the endoscope, nothing else. The cartilaginous plate of the condyle, and you remember the tumor is essentially at the level of the condyle. And you see we are at this level between uh, C0 and C1. And you have this cartilaginous place covering the tumor, which is just above. This is the tumor, this is the chordoma. This is a, if you have done seen ever a chordoma, it's a sort of gelatinous tumor. Okay, this is the, the inside of the condyle, in fact. This is the dura, you have seen just above. And you, it still works towards the midline. And you see where we are at the level of C0, C1 joint. This is the vertebral artery. We may control that with a, a micro Doppler. You see we are posterior to the, uh, C, the, the joint. And this is uh, the, the pre-op aspect and post-op aspect. Okay, Oscar. Okay. So, so we have a, a quiz here uh, about this case, 36 years old male, upper neck pain and stiffness. So what's the likeliest logical diagnosis? I'm, I'm, I'm launching a, a poll. Uh, so I give you 15, 20 minutes. So everybody, everybody can vote. You may vote, please. So is it a metastasis, biopsy, radiotherapy, procedure stabilization? Is it a pseudotumor and follow-up? It's a nostroblastoma, uh, antrolateral approach for unblock removal, no stabilization. Is this a chordoma and uh, needs a combined approach for spondylectomy and 300 degree uh, fusion? Okay, I'll give it another. So some people voted, I'm gonna close it here. So uh, we have these results, Bernard. Yes. 25% 20, of people think it's a metastasis, Five <laughs> a nostroblastoma, and 50% a chordoma. So what's, what's your take on this? Uh, metastasis doesn't look like a very uh, invasive tumor. And uh, that will not be my first diagnosis. Uh, Pseudo tumor doesn't look like a kinase, rheumatoid arthritis, synovial cyst, or things like that. And I don't know what it can be as a pseudo tumor. Uh, Cordoma, obviously, this is the most common type of tumor that you can see at this level. But um, it's normally it's more extensive. It, it should be a very small chordoma at the beginning of its evolution. Uh, in fact, it was an osteoblastoma. And so uh, with the anatolateral approach, and as you can see, this can be reached quite easily. And you may respect 
the bone which is intact. And if you keep the bone intact, you don't need any graft to replace the, 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 the destruction of the bone. Uh, so, about, where is the, the next slide? Are you show it? I don't have the next slide. Oh, here okay, it is. Don't, okay, so the, the, so the correct, the, here it is. Yeah, this is pre, this is post-operative. You can see that we can just follow. This is what I call oblique corpectomy. You arrive from the side of the, the tumor. This is the vertebral artery. You control the vertebral artery and you go through and then you remove just what is necessary. You and may ask no for need, no need for No need for stabilization in that no, case. No, no. Exactly. You see, okay. Clearly, there is nothing. Just a word about biopsy during surgery. For me, it's always wrong. Once it was a tuberculosis, and they told me that it was the more malignant tumor they have ever seen. So okay. I should uh, remove everything extensively. I don't believe them. I stop the surgery. And uh, the patient had a tuberculosis and was intact after surgery. Very good. So what this are your conclusions? Okay, so you have, you have seen that there is a great variety of tumor with the cordoma as the most common type. Never forget pseudo tumor, never, because this is completely different strategy, more conservative. Preoperative planning is important. Uh, and then at surgery, the lateral approaches are very useful for bone tumor, mostly the anterior lateral. The combination with endoscopy or the endoscopy alone are now very much in progress in many cases so that you can respect the stability. Normally, I consider that if the patient is stable before surgery, he must remain stable after surgery. It must not be the fact of the surgeon. The key point is the vertebral artery that you must in almost all cases control. Complete resection can be an objective with a limited morbidity. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Well, this was really a um, this was really a lifetime presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so my question just for the juniors in the audience, in the, uh -huh. in the participants. So, uh, due to the fact that the C1 C2 joint is more anterior than below, uh, you would consider that for intradural tumors, uh, a prostolateral approach is enough without removing the condyle and everything that it's bone anterior and natural lateral approach. This would be the, the, the main completely reason. Right. Completely right. This is why I go very fast through the prostolateral approach, which, which is mostly designed for meningioma, neurinoma, intradural tumor. Oh, yeah, very good. Completely right. And, and, for, and, for, and if you are a master of the anterolateral lateral approach with, with uh -huh. control of the vertebral artery, Probably there is not much room for, for a pure endoscopic procedure. You can, uh, do, you can take everything from, from anterolateral. The best indication is anterior midline tumor in front of the craniocervical junction. Right. Uh, the problem with endoscopy is when there is an intradural extension, the closure of the endoscopy is hazardous. But you may need it, so it's uh, just one surgery for the patient, but the problem is to close the dura. And I have, have not any CSF leak after surgery. But we do more and more, not me, I'm retired since a long time. Uh, they do more and more, just midline. And if you have midline extra dual anterior lesion, that's the best. Okay, no there, there is a question here from a, a good friend from Brazil experienced guy, Fernando Dantas, uh -huh. is asking why the reason for biopsy in the, in the cordoma that you showed us, because uh, there is the risk of leaving fragments in the trajectory of, of the, of the I biopsy. Did you, I did not show biopsy in the cordoma. I, I don't think so, but uh, Fernando was, was, was saying that, but that, that you should no, no, not no, do no, that, no, right? No, I don't, I don't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't did any, I didn't do any, uh, Biopsy exactly, is exactly. of cordoma never. But it's right. This is a danger. Okay. 
Uh, Luis Carelli, do you want to make a question, please? Uh, sorry, Oscar. Maybe that was the case of tuberculosis, which was looking maybe, like a maybe, problem at maybe. the beginning. But it was a tuberculosis. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Just, yeah. You hear me? Uh, yeah. Oh, Philip, Philip, uh, go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the tuberculosis, uh, there were other elements for diagnosis, probably a pulmonary disease, etc. So it was absolutely necessary to do an entire year transfer approach. Uh, no, you, with, the, with the lung x ray, we may have, did, have, uh, have said that it is a tuberculosis and let's go for a medical treatment. Of course, you're right. But you know, it was a sort of, uh, of uh, I don't know. Talent. <laughs> we like to do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Very good, very good. Yes, so, because Jean Dubousset always told me, is there is some kind of uh, uh, pathology, systemic pathology. It's easier to do the biopsy. A very, uh, if uh, it's difficult to do the biopsy in the vertebra, perhaps you can reach the diagnosis uh, with a biopsy on uh, an element uh, uh, much easier to be rich. You understand what I mean? For instance, in... Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I give you this example, which was uh, this aneurysmal cyst in the uh, lateral mass of Atlas. Mm -hmm. This patient was followed by rheumatologist, and they said this uh, is a malignant tumor, sarcoma, something else, and they were afraid to do a biopsy. And suddenly someone said that the vertebral artery, which is the problem, is very well known by Bernard George. And they asked me, and I said, you are not sure this is a malignant tumor. And we may go and see what it is really. Mm -hmm. And uh, the biopsy is not necessary, and it was a benign tumor. Very good. Luis Carelli, do you, do you have a question, Luis? Please, go ahead. Mic oh, microphone. Wow. He has a microphone. Yeah, Luis? I, yeah, it, yeah, I don't see him. Yeah, please. Be Bernard, in your experience, yeah. which approach you consider the best for an intra -legional lesion for lateral mass of C1? You prefer extreme lateral or far lateral approach? Sorry. Or sometimes the transoral? What's your best approach yeah. for a unilateral lesion inside the lateral mass. Okay, I don't like to use the term far lateral, extreme lateral, because I described this approach long before and saying this is anterior and posterior lateral. And I think the word, I, I, I are more explaining what it is really. It is an anterior lateral or a posterior lateral. Far lateral extreme means nothing. Okay, this is my just personal, <laughs> Uh, fight. Okay, then uh, for uh, uh, the lateral mass of Atlas, posterior lateral is not very good. The best is the ant not not the best maybe is the anterior lateral, but you may do it by endoscopy. You may do it by endoscopy. This is an extra lateral lesion, a bit lateral, and you, you can just approach. Uh, you know the the. Uh, uh, the C1 is 11 centimeters from the, the, the opening of the mask. And it's, uh, you can do it by transoral endoscopic approach, if you prefer. And this is, in my opinion, a good technique. And if you, if you are well experienced with endoscopy, it's a good technique. If you are not, anterior lateral is better. Okay, thank you. Very good. So I, I'm I think now we should move on. Bernard, thank you so yeah. much. Awesome. So we go My to- pleasure. thank you. Obrigado. You, you stay online, you stay online, Bernard. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now, now Philippe, please go ahead. Uh, Philippe Mancel is, uh, is um, a colleague of mine at, at, at CSRS. Uh, he's one of uh, the souls of CSRS Europe. He's a professor of orthopedics in, in Paris, very experienced guy. He's, uh, he's the favorite of the uh, favorite de Jean de uh, Besides surgery, he likes uh, karate and surf. Huh? Am I wrong, Philippe? 
Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. not a dangerous guy. You're not a dangerous yeah, no, guy. No, I'm not. No, no, no. You know, it's uh, for, for for you guys, but I'm I'm really not dangerous at all. You know, my uh, my my friend in sport just uh, uh, tease me. You know, I'm an has been guys, and uh, you know, uh, no, no, I'm afraid of nobody. Okay, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, it's. Uh, I would like just to introduce this case, and uh, very slowly, and just discuss afterward about uh, this young lady of uh, seven years old and she developed a stiff uh, neck unreducible with stiffness neck pain and uh, she was absolutely normal neurologically and she came at uh, my clinics and we've done uh, the six rays okay uh, i'm going to show you everything and uh, if you ask me to go back uh, i uh, show you everything so this is a normal X-ray, AP view and lateral view. This is uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, some uh, X-ray of the uh, junction and uh, a dynamic X-ray. She's stiff for young kids. And this is MRI. So my question: uh, she's coming. She's coming with no torticoli, no neurologic deficit, and she's really uh, very painful and very uh, very stiff. My question is, MRI, uh, do you think that MRI show any things and do you ask for more examination at all? Okay, you guys, I answer your, your questions. Yeah. Just go ahead with the city. The city, <laughs> okay. So go ahead with the city, okay. Ah. Okay, so very good. So I can launch the question here. Just come yeah. with the, the next slide, please. I I asked something. I would like uh, Bernard not saying anything. Okay. okay. If uh, if if you agree, because okay. I will tell you why afterwards. Okay. So can I launch the the the, the poll? Yeah, please? yeah, yeah. Do, do for okay. it. Okay. Okay. So I will ask uh, everybody. To, to, to just vote. And so what's the, the strategy for this lesion? Uh, you know, C2 corpectomy plus anterior reconstruction and posterior fusion, uh, an anterolateral approach just for removal without any, any reconstruction, or this is benign, you just wait and see and do a control scan in one year. You know, please vote. Is anybody seeing the, the voting uh, poll? So, Philip, I don't think uh, people. Yeah, I, I guess it's working, I think. Uh, yeah, but people are not voting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, this is I not think... an exam. This is not an examination. You, yeah. You, you, feel free. Feel free. Do you have any diagnosis? I mean, uh, do, you, yeah. do you want? to ask me other questions, but I'm going to help you. She was suffering particularly during night and uh, asking the, the families with some kind of aspirin, she was uh, better. So I'm, I'm helping you a lot. So I have, here, I have here Miguel, Miguel from Spain. Oh, you can't focus. Okay. Miguel? Okay. Miguel? Miguel from Spain, can you say something, please? No. No. Okay. So nobody want to uh, to discuss or to no. Maybe maybe June or Lee. Yeah. Luis. June. Yeah. No, Luis want to talk. Okay. But he has no microphone. Luis, put oh. your microphone, please. Yeah, actually, okay. I, you, you can hear me properly right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go ahead. Go ahead, John. In, in, my, in my opinion, we have another option to vote in this pool. This okay. is a, a, a lesion that uh, is look like the osteomosteoides. Probably, yeah. probably can be treated. If we can talk about that with another way, we can okay. do a yeah, minimum. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure you had another way. You always have. Yeah. Another way of thinking out it, of the box. <laughs> it's, it's 
so, so, something uh, it's not the lithic legend you have a, a bone formation and reaction in the mri in the mri you have a reaction around this bone and it's a probably you don't need a biopsy in that case in my opinion it's a radiological confirmation of the legend i think so so what you would do i do i do um hydrofrequency to treat this patient you have two options you can remove the lesion the needles with uh, with uh, a part one centimeter around the lesion it can be can be nice for you but you also can do a, a less invasive treatment even in, in in that location near the dura you can apply a, a needle and uh, do a radiofrequency by yourself or do or with a, a interventionist radiologist okay thank you thank you so Andres, okay. Andres, Andres, Andres Cambalia, our friend from uh, Fiesta Red, uh, says it, it's dangerous on this side, radio frequency. He would prefer uh, surgery. Okay, Andre? Philippe. So, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. What, what have you done? Okay. Alors, uh, we, it, it was exactly 26 years ago. And experience with radio frequency was at the beginning, and uh, uh, due to the fact that it was the beginning of experience to treat uh, osteoid osteoma, plus the, uh, uh, the difficulty to be reached by radiologists, even we work with very very skillful people in Cochin and Saint Vincent Paul. This case was discussed with my boss Jean Dubousset, and he asked me to call Bernard Georges, and I've done this uh, case with uh, Bernard at La Riboisière, and uh, he showed me the technique he developed of uh, arterolateral approach and removing the lesion with the control of the vertebral artery. So this is a CD scan after surgery, and as he said, we, did, we didn't touch uh, the posterior joint, we just have been uh, oblique in the approach of the vertebral body of uh, C2, so no instability, nothing. And uh, I follow this patient because it was 26 years ago and she developed no asymmetric uh, growth or kyphosis or something like that as described by Jean Dubousset. As soon you touch the, uh, the growth cartilage and uh, I'm really uh, from uh, Bernard, I'm not so scared with the vertebral artery. Voilà, that's all. Any question? Okay. Yeah. So Bernard, could you could you remember that case? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not here. Yeah, so yeah. It's excellent result, actually. You know, very, very good, um, very good one. Does anybody wants to make a comment? Uh, yes. Mr. Talk. Yes, now I can yes. talk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first, Please. I would uh, like to say if, you know, when you're not sure of the diagnosis of osteoidostoma, you may ask if aspirin is efficient. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was. This is a very nice confirmation of your diagnosis. Yeah. So then yeah. you are not honest. <laughs> you showed us a, a, a very bad image of the CT scan. I guess you had better image uh, because this is clearly a nidus. Normally you can see around the nidus uh, uh, something dark because it is almost free inside the cavity. And then <laughs> I did not remember that we did that together, you know. 26 ago. But I'm very, very pleased. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the nidus after biopsy was seen by the uh, the uh, uh, the anatomopathologist. Uh, so as you said, 
to be sure that uh, you reject all the tumor, it's very important for the anatomopathologist to see the nidus. If the nidus is removed, you know that you've done the job. So even the CT scan after surgery was not perfect because we don't see all the radiation as uh, Bernard said. Uh, I can tell you that uh, this, the cis patient uh, healed totally and with a very nice result. Yeah. Very good. Dr. Dr. Goel, hello. How would yes. you how would you uh, approach this case? He, as you you know, as the master has said, osteoid can be very painful, and they are benign lesions, and you cannot remove them twenty percent or thirty percent. The pain will remain, so you have to remove it completely. Partial removal may not be a good answer, and because this is completely outside the facet, outside the Thing. There is no question of instability. So you, this is a very fantastic approach, anterolateral approach, and even transoral approach is possible. And removal. The most important issue is complete radical resection. That is my strategy. Very good. Okay. Anybody wants to make a con a comment? Uh, Zan, please yeah. go ahead. Uh -huh. uh uh, What's your take on this on this case? Um, for <clears throat> I usually remove such kind of uh, C2 vertebral tumor with a transoral approach, uh, transorally, and uh, sometimes uh, with uh, aggressive uh, uh, resection of the tumor body, uh, of the C2 vertebral body, and. Uh, uh, in, in, in our hospital, we use a 3D printed uh, um, whatever body to re, re, re contrast the, uh, the anterior column of uh, C2. Uh, okay. okay. That is, it seems uh, useful for this kind of uh, patient. Okay. Thank you. Any, any, any other question here on chat? No, I don't think so. So if you, if you, if you allow me, I will present very quickly my case. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a case really for 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 the juniors. It's not really a very very not high tech case as those from Bernard or Philippe. Or uh, it's just just a you know brief remind on also the and highly unstable pathology. So in December 2012, a 40 years, uh, 48 years old male with neck pain, progressive uh, tetraparesis with the clonus, Babinski, M. Joel 12, comes to me. He has a previous operation in, in another department in December 2009, three years ago. Uh, that's the X ray I see, neutral lateral X ray in 2012. This was his X ray in 2009. That's the MRI scan. You see very, very different sequences, uh, uh, important compression in, in the C1, C2 level of the spinal cord. So we have here a progressive de neurological deterioration after a C1, C2 surgery for odontodeum. So what, what went wrong in this surgery uh, then? What's your take? Is this insufficient bony decompression? It's a C1, C2 fixation construct failure or both? You know, just at this stage of the presentation, what, what do you think? Okay, or, or June, you can, can, someone can say something. Actually, this is going to be a combination of both option number one and two, I think, yeah. Right, right. Yes, actually, that was, that was the, the, the case. Oops. Uh, so so uh, there was translation on, on the sagittal plane, despite the hooks, with ADI of 12.4, PADI of, uh, from 14.8 from to 8.8 inflection, uh, a C1, C2 instability index of almost 40%. And what, whenever you have this instability index over than 40%, you have 90% chance of myelopathy. So there was an anterior movement of C1 inflection causing decrease of the canal. And you, you actually, you can see inflection extension X-rays 
the, the change in the relative position of the hook. So this means there is some sort of multi-directional instability. This is what you see here on uh, this translation on, on CT scan. You know, you can also calculate a very nice index, the change, change of uh, atlantoaxial angle between flexion and extension position. And this angle changed almost 10, 10 degrees. And whenever the angle is higher than 20, you have a big chance of, of myelopathy. And this is, I rescued this information from, from an old paper from 96. And sometimes old papers, they convey very, very useful information. This was the, the dynamic X-ray. Uh, Flex and extension, you see important compression. So, what's what's wrong here uh, in terms of um, sorry? So, what what to do next here? Uh, <clears throat> you have an highly unstable construct, progressive deterioration, neurological deterioration. So, what what to do next? Uh, uh, and I can launch an, an inquiry here which is uh, a C1 laminectomy plus C3, C0, C3 fusion, uh, just a shorter fusion with C1, C2 fixation, C1, C2 facet joint cages, or go and do everything from anterior with the compression and fusion. So I'll I let you vote. I'll let you vote, please. Are you, you know, are you able are you able to vote? Well, you know, Oscar, I think it's malfunctioning. Uh, it's making okay. everyone a panelist, and I'm not doing that. But it's, it's I think it's malfunctioning because the first okay. one worked fine. Yes, yes, I see, John. And you, you can yeah. do anything to to correct it. Uh, yeah. I'll look into it. Okay, you might okay. have to move okay. on. Oscar, so I'll, I'll move on. I'll move Oscar, on. I'll, I'll, Oscar. Oscar. I have a question to you. I would like to know if uh, uh, on extension uh, uh, film, you have a, sac, a normal sac. I, I mean, uh, the space um, uh, of, of the cord, because uh, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, it seems that uh, this is instability, which is responsible of, uh, of the cord compression rather than a true a stenosis of the canal. You understand what I mean? So if yes, the sac yes, is okay yes. in extension, uh, my question is, do, do, you, do we need to decompress or right. rather than so, just stabilize in good position? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question, actually. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, you know, we decided that this, uh, this, uh, this case needs to be revised because obviously the, the hooks were not a good option. And the next step, we look at the surgical anatomy of the, the C2 pedicle. And you see the patient, you see the hooks here. You see that on, on parasagital CT, you have a very nice uh, pedicle here, whereas on the other side, on the contralateral side, due to high right vertebral artery, it was impossible to pass the screw. And probably this was the reason why three years before the surgeons did the, 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 the hook construct. Um, you have to know the size of the of of the of the pedicle of uh, of uh, C2, and most around 20% of the pedicles of uh, of C2 pedicles won't accept uh, a four millimeter screw. Uh, th this phenomenon, known as the high right vertebral artery, you have a decrease in the isthmus height, in the internal uh, height of of the lateral mass, and it changes uh, around one quarter of the patients. It's impossible to pass the screw. And you have a, a quite important risk of, of vertebral artery injury. But you know, it's not only it's not only this high right vertebral artery. You have also this medial loop of the vertebral artery. This uh, 90 degree branding uh, point under the, the superior articular facet of the axis, which can be not only too, too high but too medial and posterior, uh, resulting in a very narrow situismus and whirling the pedicle and thinning the, the lateral mass. This is a diagram that I found very interesting. You know, the, 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 how much pedicle you can have in function of the location and uh, of the surgical anatomy of, of the vertebral artery. You, one thing that you have to be careful as well is the, the, your C1 uh, screw antipoint. That's where the, vert, the V3 segment is closest to the, to, the, to the joint. So working in this area, better be careful especially the, the, the less experienced uh, colleagues, 
And all this dissection around the lateral end of the C2 ganglion, I always do it under microscope and with good uh, hemostasis. As, I, as you can see from one of my cases, you have almost uh, no, no, no bleeding. So leaving, uh, we were left with the option of a translaminar screw on one side, and uh, this avoids the risk of vertebral artery injury. Uh, it's much less uh, or virtually not existent than with, with C1, C2 transarticular or C2 pedicles. From a biomechanical point of view, they are really solid constructs. Some authors even consider better than C2 parts screw. Uh, this is what we did, uh, laminectomy of C1. We felt uh, the reduction was not, not that good uh, interoperatively, that were, there was compression when we were obliged to do the, the, the C1 laminectomy. And C1 uh, screw and a, a translaminar screw on, on, on the right side. This is the radiological outcome. You know, good, good. Also, something that I, I advise you to do is it's, it's to do a wide lateral decompression just to allow CSF to flow on the sides of the spinal cord. This is before and after. And this is the screw in good position and our translaminar screw on the right side. Uh, you know, blockage of, of the movement. We had a little bit kyphotic effect on, on, on C1, C2, but with a compensatory axial lordosis, then the final balance was, was good. The radiological outcome, you see good, good flow. So the take home message is that the, the, the principles of C1, C2 stability in, in oscillator view are, are violated due to an incomplete and avoidant process. To see the C1, C2 fixation is recommended for patients with neurological symptoms, signs, or, or instability. And this is a highly unstable condition with multiplanar instability. And in my opinion, hooks are not really an option. You need a more rigid construct. And if you're not able to do it, you, you, should, you should refer the patient. So your, your surgical strategy remains on determining the main pathology causing the, the myelopathy. Is it the odontoid peg? Is it the posterior arch of C1? Uh, you have to define if there is some uh, kind of uh, reduction that is possible or not. Uh, decide whether or not the lesion requires decompression and then select the, the surgical option for stabilization and fusion based on, on the surgical anatomy. So I had here another query. I see, I'm trying to see if this, no, I'm sorry. And if this goes on, once again, so let's try it. Is the, uh, also the sodium can be associated with all except atlantoaxial instability, vasular invagination, high right vertebral artery, or occipital axial instability. Okay, we'll see if it works. Doesn't work, John. Yeah, I know. I, I tried to mess with it on the control board, but... Oh, okay, don't worry. No, 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 sorry work. about that. Oh, we can vote. No. We, we can vote. vote. No. Okay. okay, so this was actually the, the, the case. I'm going to stop here. Uh, so, any, any, Philip, any comments? Uh, yeah, I have a question to you. Uh, most of uh, us auditoid are uh, recognized during pediatric uh, period. Uh, but my question is to you. You see a patient uh, with an X-ray and is close to 45 years and he has some uh, very mild trauma and you discover this kind of, uh, of uh, abnormality. So my question, he has nothing. It's just, you know, you, you've done an X-ray just to do the fact that he has a, a mild trauma and you discover also the oidoitum. What is your attitude? I mean, this is a diff this is a tough uh, situation. Of course, it depends also on how active is the guy. You know, you you tell me about a forty years old patient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, uh, discover some kind of you, yeah. you discover okay. that. Of course, we don't operate scans. We operate patients, and we have to value the symptoms. But considering you know, and I have to understand a little bit what are the expectations of the patient. What is he doing for you know, as a hobby, as a sports guy, or not? as a uh, risky activities, but consider this is a highly unstable uh, condition. I would tend to offer and discuss uh, surgery with, with, with the patient, even though it's really not symptomatic. You know, that, that would be my approach with the patient. Yeah. Dr. Gould, Dr. Gould. 
Dr. Gould? Are you in? He, he may have stepped away. Uh, okay. Oh, there he Dr. is. Dr. Gould, uh, yes, okay. he's here. Okay. Okay. Yes, please, okay. go. Okay. See, also don't join him. I will also like to, you know, in my lecture, I will give you some, some small slides of osodontoidium. Osodontoidium results in a planto axial instability. And it needs only one treatment, and that treatment is a planto axial stabilization. And it should be a solid stabilization. There is no need for any decompression, and there is no need for occipito axial fixation. Os odontoidium means atlantoaxial instability. It means atlantoaxial stabilization, period. No decompression from front or from behind, no occipital fixation. So that is my answer, Oscar. Good, thank you. Uh, Zan? Yes. Zan Chen? <laughs> Uh, excellent case, <clears throat> and I think uh, the final result is uh, uh, perfect. Uh, how do you pro how do you, do you plant some bone graft uh, between C1 and C2 during the operation? Yes, I mean, yeah, yes, yes, we could. Yes, from uh, from the from autologous bone. In my experience, uh, if I do some release uh, in between the first joint, uh, it will be easy to to redact as a dislocation between C1 and C2. And, uh, uh, and if I put some bone graft between, between the first joint, will uh, increase the bone fury rate uh, after operation. So sometimes I even put a, a very small cage in the first joint for this kind of, for this kind of uh, patient. Okay, so it, this is a good point because we have here Dr. Manzoni uh, raising this question. He thinks it's too risky for a pseudoarthrosis in a revision case doing only a C1, C2 posterior fixation and probably supplement with a, a facet joint cage or, or some sort of, of graph. Okay, good. Uh, Carelli? Let's go. We, oui. Carelli. Olay, hi. Thank you for sharing your case, Oscar. Excellent result. I think that the, the initial treatment can still be correct if you apply strut graft. Sometimes small chip bones from autologous bone don't fusion well. I think that it can be one of the reason because the hooks don't give enough stability biomechanically. But it can be treated with sublaminar wiring and strut graft and the postoperative immobilization. It's a way of treatment during only C1, C2 fusion. I, my, prefer, my preference surgical strategy is mobilizing the facet joint and applying C1, C2 fixation with the pedicle screws. It's my best treatment that you have done and you move for the laminar fixation because of the high hiding artery. Excellent result and ex excellent flow of the case. Thank you. Bernard? Uh, just a little question. I have no pediatric activity, so I don't see that. But how, how frequent is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not so frequent, but uh, I agree totally with Luis. Uh, it's not possible just to fix in kids because when you operated on young kids as uh, one year or two years old, uh, uh, you are obliged just to do a fusion, some kind of wire sometimes, and hollow cast uh, afterward because that doesn't allow any screw or anything else. So, Luis, you, I agree with you. The uh, uh, the frequency of uh, malformation 
I can tell you it was uh, 200 cases in Saint Vincent Paul during 40 years and only around 63 uh, patients operated on. Okay. So in the in the mass of patients in Saint Vincent Paul with my boss Jean Dubousset, it was not so much. Okay, Philippe, I have a question for you now. Yeah. Again, again yeah. you you know you have you have one of those syndromic patients. You know they're gonna go for Paralympics. He's an athlete, and you discover an os. What you do to those patients? No, I agree with you because uh, recently I was invited by uh, Hugues Pascal Mousselin and he showed me exactly the same case. The patient was very active, he had a very mild trauma and due to the fact that they've done uh, an x-ray and open, uh, open mouth uh, x-rays and lateral x-rays, they just discovered this, od od uh, this uh, os odontoidum and uh, the patient was not aware of anything, there was no pain, no thing. And we decided finally just to do a fusion due to the high risk of uh, developing secondary uh, uh, trauma plus a neurological deficit. And Jean Dubousset in his experience has some kind of patient no operated on and just a long term follow up. And uh, when people are getting older, uh, they can develop neurological deficit. And sometimes we have regret not to do uh, earlier surgery. So I join you in uh, this kind of uh, decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Any anybody wants to raise a question? Andre. Andre Joaquim from Brazil. You want to, to make a question, Andre? No, not really. Okay. Yeah, cool. So I, I think we're gonna move. I'm gonna invite uh, June. Uh, to share his, his presentation with us. So June, June Oli is, um, is a professor of neurosurgery, associate professor of neurosurgery in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Seoul. He's a good friend of mine and, and a very skillful endoscopic surgeon. And uh, I invited him to, to, to do his, uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. And John, you are, you are, it's too late now in, in, <laughs> in Seoul. So I, I really thank you for, for being here with us. No problem at all, because uh, actually uh, it's a Saturday night, so it's gonna be a good night. <laughs> so Just, no Saturday problem. night fever, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So just a simple case down to bring up some questions and controversy here is about the one of the probably the most frequent cases you can see during the outpatient clinic or in the hospitals. It's gonna be about the C1 diffusion for the what well, is called lateral male arthroplasty. So it's gonna be the lady 65, only suffering from intractable posterior neck pain only. Sometimes it's getting radiated to the both arm and head sometimes. But the, actually, in terms of sensory and motor function, there was nothing much about what is called neurological deficit. She says it's going to be a little bit weakness in the grasping power in, in terms of elbow and flexion extension, but the, actually it was like being very subjective. And she told it pretty well, except that suffering from provocation of neck pain. So this is her MRI what is called dynamic MRI. You can see it on the flexion and extension images as well, as well as a neutral. So there was nothing much about the, what is called true cranial cervical junction myopathy or any kind of compromise at the occipital cervical junctions, except that some of these, some abnormality can be visualized at the tip of the odontal process there. And as you go further to the CT scan, with the, some of these three dimensional reconstructions, what I can find out is that there is a something discrepancy between right and left side of the lateral mass joint between C1 and C2. And as you draw the kind of a man ray or Chamberlain base of the skull base line there, actually the odontoid tip is a little bit creeping up to there but the still spinal canal or even up to the subcular junction space is still well preserved. And on the coronal, or coronal CT scans, probably can see some of the bearing 
or a little bit they're tilting to the right side. And open mouth view, you can clearly see the difference between right and left side in terms of a lateral mass joint there. So the problem is, is that you can see some destructive erosion on the right side, C1 and C2 lateral mass joint there. And it is gonna be a little bit vertical. Sorry, I, I, I did something here. I think we can we can try to see if we can we are successful with the pool. Just okay. just raise the questions, please. Give it a shot. So the question so, is that the what will be the correct diagnosis for this patient? Okay. So we can start voting. Is it uh, TVJ compressive myelopathy we, we associated with panels formation. Is it Atlanta oh, axial it, instability, it, subluxation with increased ADI, baseline basination, or TVG vertical instability in, incurred by atropathy of C1, C2 lateral mass? Okay, so John, John, John Bennett, I made it to work. Eh? You need to hire me. Yeah, I guess so. You fixed it. I fix it, huh? There you go. <laughs> you need to hire me. Okay. So let, let's stop. Let's ah. stop here. And I will share with you the result. So, June, I think most of the people think it's option uh, number four. Vertical instability due to uh, atropathy of C1, C2 lateral mass. So, I think the yeah, audience is a very good decision in terms of the correct terminology for the diagnosis because uh, actually I was a little bit skeptical whether the audience will pick Bazilla in Benesha as part of diagnosis. But the, this patient has okay. a real big, there is nothing much of the discrepancy in terms of a flexion and extension image. You don't see any kind of some widening of the ADI or there's nothing much about the instability between atom and vexial. And clearly see the lateral mass erosion on the right side. So I should say this is gonna be the loss of the integrity between the C1 and C2 lateral mass causing the vertical, consequent vertical instability. I think that's will be the correct diagnosis. So what's gonna be the plan for this patient? Okay, let's see, we can, we can, uh, we can vote. Oh. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, please, sorry. Okay, we can vote. So probably there's something much to be done on the what this eroded part of the C1 and C2 lateral mass on the right side. So it's gonna be the simple, it's, uh, but how to create, it's not just about the C1 and C2 posture fixation, but how you can create some of the stabilization into that facet, I mean, the lateral mass joint there. So it's a little video that I want to show you. Actually, it's a C1 lateral mass screw first, 32 millimeters. And I insert it on both sides, C2 lamina screws, reaching up to the passage joint of C1 and C2. This is part of the C2 knob root resection on the right side. And you can clearly see the eroded part of the lateral mass joint there. Actually, it's gonna be widespread out using the simple dilator. Since the space is a little bit creepy, I created some of the more drilling deep into the lateral eroded part of the last mass joint, cut real small tiny cage of three millimeters. And since I'm probing there, inserting the C1 lateral mass screw cell, and that's you go to see the final construct after being corrected with the rod insertion, which is bent it. And that was like this left side image is before and right side is the after the operation. Actually, there was a little bit improvement in terms of what is the, like the over translocation of Basila. The thing is that you can see the quite clear difference between right and left side after the operation. And you can see the cage inserted over there. And you can see that the balanced posture of the either side of the C1. So this is like a three-dimensional image is constructed there. And this is before and after the surgery, the post op MRI. So the clinical course was actually following the radiological consequences. The pain was dramatically subsided. 
And the patient said she feels very good and her hand and arm power is also getting improved. So question okay. number two for the poll. Yeah. Please. Uh, the reception of this, while you are doing this kind of structural surgery, is it safe to resect out the C2 rubber roots? Okay, so please you can vote. So it, it's acceptable without any sequela. It's not desirable due to neurological compromise or its own choice of surgeons depend on the necessity during the procedure. So please vote. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. So it seems, June, that not uh, most of the people are not dogmatic. They do <laughs> it dependent on the necessity during the surgery, and twenty percent think they can do it without any sequela, and a very very tiny portion of people, three percent, say it's not desirable due to neurological compromise. So what's what's your your opinion about this? So actually, there's like a, actually we have a distinguished guest, professor, guest speaker here with a professor Arthur Gowell. He's been asserting this, that it is very relatively safe to resect out this TCC to nerve root without any kind of some complication or sequelae. Starting from 1994, about 26 years ago, he has a very long series, so he's going to be quite sure and persuasive about that. But the thing is that in recent report, Coming from the United States, like a University of Virginia, as Christian Shaffrey says that in distant portion of his patient, almost 28% of the patients are suffering from C2 neuralgia or C2 hypothesia or any kind of some other untoward syphilis among his series over the past four years. So it can bring up some controversies because it, it was supposed to be safe it's supposed to be known as a say, relatively safe and sound, but they, there's a lot of some controversy growing up after this C2 neuralgia development and hypothesis as well. So we need to have a little discussion and consensus about, about the resecting of the C2 neurectomy during the, this C1, C2 posterior fusion procedures. Okay, so thank you. I, I, I think Professor Goel keeps uh, 26 years later the same opinion. We'll hear from him. Are you done? Hi, John. Are you yeah. done? Okay, yeah. thank you. So I, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, so why why uh, did you decide to do translaminar and not pedicular or pass C two screw, and why not bilateral uh, bilateral cages? You you risk by inserting only one a little bit of scolio. Actually, if you can see through the post MRI, post CD scan, actually, this is the, the reason why I inserted trans. Lamina screw was that, as I mentioned before, this is like, a, I was like a, under the study comparing the structural and strength integrity comparison between the trans pedicle and trans lamina screw and the, at the level of C2 at the time. So this patient was assigned to the trans lamina screw at the time. So there was no any kind of reason that I skipped the trans pedicle. So that was the reason why I inserted a trans lamina. Second thing is that the, as you can see through the post op CT scan, Right side has been lifted up a little bit, but that was the, there was a little, any kind of some discrepancy in terms of height between C right and left side and it's in terms of C1 lateral mass, because it seems to be a little bit larger because I create a hole using the drill and create enough spaces. But as you can see on the top of the height of C1 and uh, occipital condyle, there's nothing much of the discrepancy between right and left side, it is balanced. So this is, seems to be, heightened, but there was nothing more heightened except that the Einstein did provide the stability at the right side of C1. 
very good to excellent case. I really, I really like this case. Uh, there is someone here asking why, you, if you have done a PET scan, just to clarify the lesion, the C1, C2 lesion, or you, you, you didn't think it was, was uh, necessary. Your voice is not perfect, uh, Oscar. PET scan, PET scan. Oscar, uh, oui? microphone doesn't work perfectly uh, uh, when you talk. Yeah. Mm. I have a question a, to you. I yeah. have a question to you guys. When yeah. you talk to the anat anatomist and Andre Combalia is there, they really hate to cut C2 roots. So I would like to know the, uh, yes, and Bernard too, uh, the advice of uh, people who are really anatomists like uh, Andre Combalia, like uh, Jean-Marc Vital and uh, all, you, all you guys. Oscar, yeah. if I may answer. Oui, oui. When you approach the vertebral artery, you cut the C2 root if you want to transpose the vertebral artery or to work around the C1, C2 segment. I've never seen any problem. I, I used to tell my patient that they will have, after the surgery, and they have more or less, some less of a sensation into the ear lung and the angle of Joe. So I told, I, I tell them for the kiss you asked for the other side and when you shave, you, you, you take care. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> Professor, Professor Gould, what's your take on C2 nerve root sacrifice? Microphone. Yeah. It should be C2, on. You see, C2 neurectomy should be done when it is necessary. But C2 ganglion is about one centimeter thick and it completely blocks the atlantoaxial joint from behind. So I, you know, initially I used to cut the C2 ganglion in all my cases to get a very big exposure. But as the experience goes, I can mobilize it up and mobilize it down and very rarely I need C2 nerectomy. But if it is required, if your exposure is not good, it must, it should be done. And that is just gives numbness in this area, nothing too much, but it gives you a very, very big exposure and you can do under vision. I think it should not, you should not hesitate to cut it, but if you can avoid it, it is better. Why to cut a nerve when you can avoid it? So nowadays I do not cut it in almost all cases, except in very se severe basal invagination and things like that. Okay, I have here, a, maybe for you, Professor Gould, a question from a friend from Saudi Arabia, uh, Professor Baisa, and is asking uh, what measurements do you use for coronal inclinations to assess, I guess, scoliosis on, on, on craniovertebral junction? I should say there's nothing established measurement method in terms of coronal imbalance in, at the occipital cervical junction because we do have a lot of us measurement in terms of sagittal, but the, in, in terms of coronal, there's nothing. Much. The two measurement I can say is the compare the height between occipital condyle. Second thing is the upper tip of the lateral method, the C1. Okay. Professor Gould? Yes. Please. See, more important is when, you know, the balance. When you see the, like what June uh, showed the scan when there was a unilateral facetal issue. The other side was not, other side was normal. So in this situation, you know, what is the most important thing is the whole, the atlantoaxial joint is an unstable joint. It is one side is affected, but the entire, both sides are having problem. So you have to ultimately stabilize the atlantoaxial joint on both sides, like what you have done. And I think what you have done is a very fantastic procedure. I think that is the appropriate. You have to open the joint. You see what normally I do is in all cases, even in your case, open the joint 
even if it is seen to be vertically collapsed, but you can open it and introduce bone graft in a collapsed joint and make it a little wider. And also on the normal side, you have to put and block the joint. So both sides, you have to introduce bone inside the joint on both sides and then do your instrumentation. This is what I do. Okay, thank you. Jun, thank you so much for, for this wonderful case. As Dr. Goel said, I'm going to proceed to, to Luis Carelli from, uh, from uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Luis is a good friend of mine as well. He's chief of spine center at National Institute for Traumatology and Orthopedics. He's a board director of uh, the Brazilian Spine Society and, and the Canyon Virtual Junction Society. And he's a very, very experienced surgeon. So please go, Luis, go ahead. Luis? Now it's okay? Yeah, please share your screen, please. Now it's okay. Yes, perfect, I'm, perfect. I'm going to talk about the cranial vertebral instability associated with the Grisel syndrome. I'm going to present a case in discussion with everybody. Quickly, to review the Grisel syndrome is a very rare disease, predominantly <laughs> found in pediatric patients and it's characterized by a non-traumatic subluxation between C1 and C2, leading to a painful torticollis. The onset of symptoms occur usually in chronologically direct connection with a precedent otorhinolaryngological intervention or infection after a symptom-free interval, and sometimes idiopathic or minor trauma. The classic classification about this dislocation was described by Fielden and Hawkins. And we have four different types, ranging from rotatory dislocation only, with the center of rotation of the, the axis, the dance, unilateral dislocation with the center of rotation based on the lateral mass, bilateral dislocation type three and the posterior dislocation type four. We needed to haul out the other disease, the differential diagnosis. In, in that figure, you have a, a congenital scoliosis of the cervical spine can lead to a similar appearance. And you can see different disease in the first line a children with uh, Grisel syndrome treated by transoral reduction and fusion with Raham's plate. The, the intermediate patient with severe complex basilar invagination treated by posterior distraction and insertion of a uh, peak case. And uh, the last nine uh, patient with a torticollis, with a spasm, a congenital disease, torticollis congenital, that the only treatment was a bipolar release of sternocleidomastoideal muscle. And the clinical example for discussing here with, with everybody, we have a, a children female with nine years old with torticollis after otorhinolaryngology procedure and developed a painful fix, fixed C1, C2 dislocation with one near and half of evolution. The neurological exam of these children was normal at that time. And this was the picture of the patient. You can see the patient with a 
try to to have the head straight, creating a a a, a great force of muscles and uh, generate pants to maintain the horizontal ga gaze. And the, in the axial view of the tomography, you can see a lot of bone formation, ankylosis between the arch of C1 and the odontoid process, and also inside the facets of C1, C2. This is a type two of fielding Hawks classification of the dislocation. We have this dynamic X-rays showing no motion between C1, C2. And the, the MRI, you have a bone without any compression of the spine cord. Any comments at that moment, Oscar? Okay, or... you will go ahead for the, the, the treatment choices. The treatment, you have again the, the CT scan showing a unilateral dislocation and the, the contralateral side, you have a small space of the facet joint, a lot of bone formation between the arch of C1 and the odontoid process and the treatment strategies. The choice for everybody can vote now. Okay, so I launched the, the voting. Conservative treatment, posterior C1, C2 in situ instrumentation fusion, transoral extrapharyngeal release and anterior, uh, posterior C1 facet extraction and fusion, and transoral extrapharyngeal release and posterior fusion. So another another more seconds. And I guess I'm gonna for the sake of time. Closing here. Uh, so these are the results, uh, Luis. Uh, most of the people would go for 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 option uh, D and E, uh, a little bit more for the transoral extrapharyngeal release and posterior fusion. Okay. Uh, you know, at this point, we may ask, uh, you know, the experts here, what they would do to the case. I don't, uh, Professor Gould? Can you say something? Your comments? I don't know if he stepped away or not. Let me check. No. Okay, Luis. So you go ahead with your case, then we discuss at the end. Okay. The literature about this, you have some articles supporting doing some kind of treatment based on the, the grade of the dislocation. You have this publication applying only soft color soft blaze for type one, a more rigid color for type two, and the aloe vest for type three, and only advocate surgery for type four. On the other hand, you have a literature advocating reducing and fixing by the posterior C1, C2 instrumentation, like the goel Harms technique. And you have literature supporting doing temporary or permanent C1, C2 stabilization by transoral approach by a group of hearts. And this new article released for algorithm of treatment based not only in the degree of the dislocation, but in the time of the duration of the symptoms and the dislocation. 
In this algorithm, these authors advocate a spontaneous observation because a spontaneous resolution can occur in three days. If the disease is longer than three days, advocate close reduction and insert a rigid color like a Philadelphia. In case of recurrent dislocation, you need the close reduction and apply a low vest for rigid stabilization. And in rare recurrence and persistent instability, they advocate posterior C1, C2 fusion. This is the steps from that authors, analgesia and immobilization for three days. After three days, close reduction. We can apply this kind of reduction. Or if you have a recurrent dislocation, you can apply the Jesenski maneuver to try to reduce and insert the aloe vest and open reduction. In our hands, in our experience, if you have a difficult in reduction, but without ankylosis, we can apply posterior C1, C2 distraction for reduced by posterior. But if you have a anterior ankylosis by the anterior arc of C1 and the odontoid process, it's necessary an anterior release or by a transoral approach or extrapharyngeal approach and a fixation. Okay, Luis. And the case again. And we decide to do the release and the osteotomy by the anterior approach. We don't do a tracheostomy in that case, only other tracheal intubation. You use the Alan Crocker retractor. We preserve the soft pilot, insert and suture a nasal catheter, and put in the upper position the soft pilot to address the, the pharyngeal. And here you have the, the, the address for the transoral approach and doing the osteotomizing of the ankylosis and try to mobilize the facet joint from the front. From the front. Here the video, you use the Harmian smelt approach because if you need to address the lateral portion of the, the facets, it's better to use this kind of flap instead of the midline approach. You can reach without damage to the soft tissues. And the, 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 the reposition of the C1 work after removing the ankylosis and the, the mobilizing of the C1, C2 joint. And in posterior, the, in the, the same day you, you perform as a posterior approach insert the polyaxial screws in lateral mass, but in that time, the lateral mass of C1 is very thin because you remove the part of the facet and the, the lateral mass and insert the, the screws in the lateral mass in pedicle of C1. And that is the result of the patient. A better alignment, correct the coronal alignment, only with C1, C2 fusion unisegmental fusion. And this is the result of the X-ray with the correct placement of the instrumentation. You remove the, the, all the bone between the arch of C1 and the, the odontoid process. And the, the summaries for approach of craniovertebral anomalies, you can use this algorithm also. If you have a compression or ankylosis of from the front and the ET disease is unreducible, you can do a transoral approach. If the transoral approach make it unstable, you can add instrumentation from the front or you can move the patient and do fixation from the back. And the conclusion of that case in our case, osteotomy was done via transoral route in order to correct the ankylosis and reduce the atlantoaxial joint. And the posterior approach was also done for C1, C2 fusion. Okay. Luis? Okay. Thank you, Luis. Uh, you know, 
very, very, very elegant case as always. You know, we, I have, a, you I have a question. A good, a good experience here, uh, Philip. Just a moment. Let let, let me, Doctor Gould, ask me ask me <laughs> to make questions. Doctor Gould, uh, what's your take on this uh, instability and and the solution? Then I, I want to hear Philip. Yeah. Yes, the uh, rotatory, rotatory atlantoaxial dislocation was, you know, very, it was not understood. And nobody actually treated rotatory atlantoaxial dislocation for a long time. Conservative treatment was the only option. Then Alan Crocker did some anterolateral approach and manipulated the joint. But essentially, rotatory dislocation was not treated. So about 20 years ago, we describe posterior approach, posterior, as uh, Luis has shown. Posterior approach and, you know, open the joint and maneuver the facets from both. So release what he has done from anterior, I would have certainly avoided. I don't go anterior and do anything from front. And I think I can do everything from behind in one approach, open the joint, maneuver the facets quite ag aggressively, then introduce a lot of bone graft in both the joints under vision, do fixation. So my situation is, I don't know how much bone was necessary to remove that Lewis has removed, but I do it completely, entirely posteriorly for a long time and with many cases now over the period of time. Excellent. Luis, what's your answer? Uh, I agree with you, Professor Goyle. I do all from behind. I learned with you to do that. <laughs> but in that case, this patient had a lot of bone, ankylosis bone between the arch of the C1 and the, the odontoid processes. Everything was fused. It's, it's, it was necessary to remove all this bone in new formation to allow mobility during, during only the posterior treatment. In, the, in that case, I was not so comfortable. I prefer to remove it by the front to allow a better and anatomic reduction of the C1, C2 joints Good. because of that reason. Okay, Filippo. You, yeah, you, uh, uh, you yeah. Experience with kids, you know. Yeah, uh, uh, congratulations! It's a very nice case. I have three things to say. First, Grizel was a French guy, published uh, in the Presse Medicale in thirty in nineteen thirty. Uh, my question is, uh, and I asked the question to uh, Bernard Georges too. Um, uh, Alan Crocard, I've done uh, a publication, uh, um, a communication of vertebral artery injuries. And he said by transfer approach, as soon as there is a huge rotation, the vertebral artery is not exactly the, in the good position. So my question is to you, uh, Bernard, are you scared by this kind of very important rotation with the vertebral artery? You don't know exactly where the vertebral artery is anatomically. I'm answer? Yeah. Oui. Yeah. Oui, oui, vas-y. Okay. <laughs> J'y vais. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen many cases of intermittent uh, compression of the vertebral artery. It's called bow hunter syndrome. Like uh, the Japanese uh, archer, they follow the, 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 the target. And so the, they rotate the head. And sometimes they, they rotate so much that they compress the vertebral artery. In fact, I've done many, uh, I've done many angiography with normal patient. And, in a normal position at extreme rotation. I have never seen a cooperation in normal patient. You must have something else, a bony malformation, uh, a ligament, uh, for that, okay. So um, I, have I have no experience with this uh, sort of uh, grief. <laughs> I think that the, the question from Professor Bessel was the dangerous situation about the root of the transoral approach when the C1, C2 is very dislocated rotationally. And in this situation, you need to start careful in the midline and after that, you go 
to the lateral portion. And because of that, to have the control of the situation, I prefer, by two reasons, to perform the, the approach in the pharynge, like a door flap, like described by Schmelzi and Harmes, instead to do the midline approach. Because with that approach, you can cover, if is desired, your prothesis without uh, the booking of the prothesis and uh, can be a cause of descent. And uh, you, using this kind of approach, you can reach from one side to the other side, to coast to coast the C1, C2 facet joint by the front. My, but in this specific case, you need to start on the odontoid process and the careful go to the lateral to avoid the la uh, a vertebral artery injury during the exposure. Okay, so guys, we, we still have uh, more to, to, to lecture, so we need to, to speed up. I'm sorry. Eh? So now, now I call, I'll call the Zan Chen from, from, uh, from uh, Beijing, is a professor of neurosurgery at the Shu Hu. Shu Wanhu Hospital in Beijing is a very experienced uh, surgeon on cranial vertebral junction. And um, Chan, I, I ask you to, to, to share your presentation with us. Thank you. Zan? Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing my presentation. Yes, please. Uh, in China mainland, we have also a lot of severe uh, malformation uh, cases, uh, and uh, I think most of them are at plantar axial dislocation. Uh, from etiology, there's uh, several several uh, we can classify the several re regions uh, for uh, at plantar axial dislocation, such as uh, trauma. And uh, a lot of uh, congenital uh, condition may lead to uh, C1C2 dislocation and also some inflammatory regions. Um, we can divide it, uh, this kind of uh, etiology uh, region, regions, regions uh, into two kinds. <clears throat> the first uh, several etiology regions, such as trauma or odontoid, this, this kind of um, pathological region, they all always uh, uh, destroyed the central part between C1 and C2. And then uh, uh, C1 and C2 dislocated in both the central area and the bilateral facet joint. But uh, hospitalization of atlers is a congenital uh, condition. Um, at first, uh, <clears throat> affected bilateral facet joint. And uh, first, uh, it uh, caused the uh, basal imagination, and uh, later, the facet joint uh, have deformed. Uh, and then later, it uh, affected the, the, the central part of uh, C, between C1 and C2. So, uh, if uh, according to the pathological uh, regions, uh, it's, uh, there's some difference between this kind of uh, condition. So, um, first, uh, um, if uh, there's some strategy for uh, C1C2 dislocation, I, I think first uh, Professor Gore uh, gives the answer. Uh, his technique is very useful for the <coughs> C1C2 dislocation. With uh, C1C2 uh, internal fixation, we can reduct this kind of dislocation. But uh, if uh, there is some uh, basal imagination, uh, Accompanied with a uh, uh, C1C2 dislocation, then it will be more complex. First, we should push the C2 downward to reduct basal imagination, and the second, we push C2 anteriorly and reduct C1C2 transverse dislocation, and then we can get the final re result. Um, <clears throat> cage implantation 
it's very, very useful for this kind of uh, uh, the reduction of baseline regeneration. So uh, we usually plant a cage with enough height for, for the reduction of baseline regeneration. And I designed some uh, uh, release uh, uh, tools to re re release the first joint and uh, distract between the first joint and uh, uh, a set, uh, some of cage. And uh, this is uh, the procedure how I manipulation in the first joint. And uh, this is uh, how I use my tools uh, to release the first joint. Uh, the intraoperative uh, CT scan shows uh, the, rule, the tools in the first joint. Mm, with this technique, uh, we can get uh, some uh, a lot of uh, uh, Excellent result for this kind of uh, basal regeneration and the uh, C1C2 dislocation. The patient uh, have uh, uh, a decompression operation before, but uh, the uh, dislocation does not uh, uh, re re restored. And uh, the first joint, uh, just some uh, information of the first joint, and uh, 3D it is kind of showed the underground, so the uh, Mm, abnormal running of vertebral artery, but uh, we still can release the first joint from posterior approach, and we can put a cage in the first joint. Uh, with the gross technique, we can reduct the first the dislocation perfectly. And uh, in there some cases the malformation is very severe, and uh, <clears throat> but if we can expose the first joint from posterior approach. Uh, always we can distract uh, this kind of a first joint and the plant cage in the first joint, then we can get a, a reduction uh, of the C1C2. Uh, today I'll, I'll show, uh, discuss a case, a very special case. Uh, it's a male, 30 years old. He suffered numbness and uh, weakness of four extremities and uh, aggravated uh, in recent two years. Uh, from uh, X-ray, we can see there is a dislocation and basal vagination between C1 and C2. Uh, MRI showed a very severe compression of the cord. And the CT scan showed uh, in the central part, in the central area, there's a dislocation. Uh, it seems uh, there's, a, there's a, also odontoid, but uh, bilateral first joint uh, uh, <clears throat> also malformed uh, severely. Um, I think uh, this area is uh, C2 lateral mass at this area. Uh, and this is a C2. Uh, also there is um, a clip field syndrome, C2, C3, uh, C3 C4 filling together. This is uh, the letter mass of C1. So how to reduct this, uh, this kind of uh, dislocation? Okay, so I'm starting a... Can yeah, I, I can give more, more detail of the 3D of uh, this, can, this, this point, uh, this case. Uh, from 3D, we can see the vertebral artery is running bilaterally as here. Uh, and uh, my question is uh, how, to, how to perform this case. Uh, is this a posterior approach enough or anterior approach, approach enough? Or we should uh, do anterior and the posterior approach or posterior and anterior approach? How to, uh, how to choice the, the approach? Okay, so I open to, to for pulling. Uh, we'll allow a little more. I think... Uh, I, I can show these uh, slides and, and I help, uh, to okay. help others. To, to okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to share the, the, the results. So most of the, the participants, almost 60% feel the posterior approach is enough. Uh, a quarter of them would say a combined approach, but doing first anterior and then posterior approach, and that's basically the, the, the results. Can you show us what you have done, uh, Zan? Yeah, okay. 
uh, <coughs> with this lens, if uh, with a positive approach, it means that we have to uh, separate the, 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 because the first joint is here. We have to, uh, we, ha we can drill part of C2 and uh, expo expose the first joint. But uh, I do not, uh, I'm not sure whether I can uh, expose the first joint also. Uh, it's hard. It's, uh, it's too hard. So I choose the uh, anterior and the posterior approach. First, uh, excuse me. First, uh, with the anterior approach, I just uh, perform uh, on the toilet section and decompress the spinal cord. And uh, uh, with this procedure, we, we can get uh, some release of the anterior first joint. And then with the posterior approach, I perform the internal fixation and fusion. Uh, after operation, we can, we can see the spinal cord was decompressed uh, uh, totally. And uh, we can also, because uh, the anterior first joint are released uh, with a posterior approach, we also adjust uh, the, the <coughs> clever's uh, whatever angle to uh, more better. So the spinal cord are decompressed more better. Mm, the patient recovered very well, his symptoms relieved after operation. Uh, so this is uh, my opinion. Um, posterior manipulation of a fast joint and the cage, implant, cage implant, implantation will solve most of uh, our uh, cases. But uh, if uh, the manipulation of a fast joint uh, seems uh, <clears throat> quite impossible, anterior decompression and uh, release is uh, still valuable. It's my point. Thank you. Okay. Uh... John, very, very, very good case. And uh, actually, I think probably the, 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 the anterior release was really the secret to, to, to uh, manipulate the cleaval canal angle. But uh, I guess uh, Dr. Gould says that there are no irreducible C1, C2 cases. Uh, Dr. Gould, what's your take on this case of uh, Zan? Dr. Gould? Open the microphone. Your... Yeah, yeah, I did. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. There, there yeah, go. Zen. I'm happy to Hi, see your kid. I'm happy nice to, to see you. your very <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah nice I'm to very you. happy to see your case. But you know what? You have shown only one one section of the image. Yeah, if you yeah. had shown coronal image, other image, three D image, I could have seen the facets more properly. But this, in this any case, a... but in any case, you know what? I do not do this anterior surgery at all. In any case, no zero, completely mm -hmm. for several years now. And uh, it was possible to do it from behind. This is my feeling. Of course, I have not seen your all the images and your case is quite difficult. I agree, quite difficult case. But uh, I have no, I don't do anterior, no decompression, no decompression in any case. Mm. Only realignment is my answer to your, to any craniovertebral junction issue, Zan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> okay, Luis, Luis, Luis uh, what do you think? You know, I know that you like anterior approaches. Yeah, uh, Luis has done, Luis has done, you know, anterior plating. He was doing when he visited me, he was having anterior plate, anterior reduction. He was doing at that time when he came to me, Luis. Yes, I, I, I agree with Professor Goyle. Uh, this is a challenge case. Thank you for your case, Zen Chen. It's very difficult. 
Sometimes I have the same doubt around the, to do anterior or posterior, but this case is, is such a mobile. If you put in traction, interoperative traction, you can rearrange these angles and the facet joint inclination. And it, it's possible to do by posterior. You can remove the tip of the top of the part articular of C2 to reach the C1, C2 joint. You can do that. And sometimes if you are, if you are doing the surgery with the microscope, it's better. I normally have experience to perform this kind of distraction surgery with a direct visualization. But with this very handy C1, C2 joint, it's better to use the microscope to insert the cage and to insert the screw. Because if you don't use the microscope in this very handy situation, you need to inclinate your head to insert the screw and do the job in that position with uh, torticollis by the, the surgeon. <laughs> and it's possible doing traction around the 150% of the entire weight of the patient and control by, by after the, the approach, if you release the soft muscles and the ligaments, you have more reduction. And if you reach the, the joint and the do distraction, you can get more reduction also. Okay, Luis, thank you. Do you have any uh, comments then? Yeah, before the operation, we, we, we tried skull traction under a, a general anesthesia. Uh, also, really um, totally muscle uh, strength. And, uh, but uh, uh, with uh, six, uh, uh, one six uh, of uh, one six uh, of body of his body weight, skull traction, there's not a enough reduction of uh, between C1 and C2. So we tried until release and posterior, posterior internal fixation. And uh, I have seen you use the anterior plate to re reduct this kind of uh, dislocation. Do you think uh, after anterior release, you can directly use the anterior plate to perform uh, um, reduction of this kind of case? So posterior approach is not needed. Because uh, in China, we have uh, also some orthopedic os surgeons. Uh, they do anterior release and uh, uh, anterior plate to, for this kind of case. And uh, they have uh, a, a successful experience for this kind of case. They have uh, show, show me their experience. And uh, I think uh, anterior pr procedure is, by, is uh, more, more suitable for this kind of case. Zan, we have questions here from the chat. Of course, you always do with with interoperative monitoring, of course. And have you done it with the with the, with the navigation, interoperative navigation? Do you need it? Uh, navigation is uh, seldom use, used. We have navigation, but uh, we, we seldom use navigation for this kind of uh, patient. But uh, I think uh, interoperative. Uh, CT scan is a very useful for this kind of patient because uh, uh, with the uh, intraoperative CT scan, we can uh, exact uh, evaluate uh, how it uh, reducted and uh, whether the reduction is uh, okay or not. Thank you. I think we are running late and I'm, I'm calling uh, Dr. Gould for, for to, to close with golden key. Uh, professor Gould is, uh, is professor and head of neurosurgery at King Edwards Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. He's a, he's a, he's a prolific neurosurgeon, a role model for, every, for us. He does everything perfect from brain to, to spine. And he's certainly a leading uh, expert in cranial vertebral junction. So uh, Atul, please go ahead and, and give us your, your, your lecture. Okay, Oscar, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to people who are interested in craniovertebral junction. And I can tell you to be interested in craniovertebral junction is not easy. 
not many people are interested. So it is a very good opportunity to talk to the people who are really interested. And I wish I can give some new messages to, to the young and senior people alike. Let, let me see if, I, if it is worthwhile. So craniovertebral junction is a complex situation. Either do it properly or don't do it. Either you give new life or you kill the person. So you have to do, you have to understand, you have to really work on this subject. Atlantoaxial joint is a very majestic joint. This, you see the facet of C1 is one of the strongest facets in the whole body. You take a hammer, you cannot beat it. You cannot destroy it. It is the strongest facet of the whole body. Occipitoatlantal joint is the strongest joint of the whole body. Atlantoaxial instability is an uncommon instability or an extremely rare occipitoatlantal. Transverse process of C1 is the biggest transverse process of the body. C2 spinous process is the biggest spinous process of the body. So this is a very majestic and odontoid process is the most unique bone and the most dangerous bone of the entire body. So it is, we are dealing with a complex subject. Facets are the center of fulcrum of movements. So if you have to stabilize the joint, you have to stabilize the facet. Craniovertebral junction instability means atlantoaxial instability. This is the most mobile joint of the body, but it is the most unstable joint of the body. Craniovertebral junction stabilization is equal to atlantoaxial stabilization. Occipital bone should not be included in the atlantoaxial stabilization. So my technique, which we described in actually in 1987, so 33 or 34 years ago, one screw in C1, one screw in C2, all of you know that this technique is biomechanically a very strong and very stable technique. So these are my cases in the year 1988. So 32 years ago, I did this fixation. Now over the period, my experience is nearing 2,700 cases with this kind of fixation. I, for last several years, I don't include the occipital bone in the fixation construct. My technique has three steps, open the joint, right from 1987, open the joint, remove the cartilage, put bone graft in the joint, and then do fixation. C2 ganglion is right in front of the joint. You see quite a big joint. And this opening neurectomy gives you a window to the atlantoaxial joint. As I mentioned, you don't need to cut the ganglion. You can come under the ganglion, you can go over the ganglion, but the three steps, opening the joint, introducing the bone graft should never be left behind. The other very important issue is of the vertebral artery, which has a very unique relationship and you have to be very conversant with the vertebral artery if you have to do this technique properly and without fear. So vertebral artery can sometimes go very obliquely down inside the facet. This is the joint and to introduce the screw can be quite dangerous. So you have to know very clearly the artery comes like this and then goes not so much. This is a very rare dissection that we did, but it can indeed go like that. So understanding of the vertebral artery is very critical. It can have anomalous course. It can have different course. And so I have realized that three dimensional models that we first described are very critical to understand the anatomy and then to put the screw in a proper direction. So this was the only dislocation, Atlanto action, Atlanto dental interval disturbance was the only parameter to do fixation and still the only parameter described is Atlanto dental interval disturbance and cord compression. You see this, these are the operations which we have done several years ago, fixation, reduction and fixation. I had described also an alternative technique, one screw in C1 and the other screw like Megal's technique and double insurance fixation. You see one screw has gone in C1 and one is like Megal's technique. But I, of course, this is not a regular thing we can use when it is required. C2 is a atypical bone. This is the superior facet of C1 and this is the inferior facet of C1. You see that they are one above, they are not one in line. This is anterior, this is posterior. And the vertebral artery comes in relationship to the superior facet. So I will give you now a very beautiful alternative technique. 
you see the C1 superior facet is here, inferior facet is here. And when you cannot introduce your screw in the superior facet, you can use the inferior facet. You can put your screw in the transarticular fashion or you can introduce your screw in the C2 facet like this. And this paper is also quite a wonderful article. You see, this is this inferior facet. If you cannot the high riding vertebral artery, you cannot introduce your screw, but you can do a transarticular C23. And this is a beautiful technique. You see, this is a complex situation. One screw in C1, the other, the C2 screw, there is no place. So you can introduce a C23 screw. And this is a quite a wonderful technique. You can also recently I described in high riding vertebral artery, you can drill off a little bit here and mobilize the vertebral artery. Mobilization of the vertebral artery can be a very fantastic tool. So mobilize the vertebral artery. So this is a, you see this is high riding vertebral artery. You cannot introduce your screw here. This is completely high. So you can actually drill that area and mobilize the vertebral artery down and introduce the screw. This is a worthwhile, wonderful technique. And this can, you see high riding vertebral artery. You cannot introduce your screw. So mobilize the, open, drill this little bit area, mobilize the vertebral artery and introduce this screw. It is not such a difficult technique. For the first time in the literature, we described translaminar screws were described by us first time. And this is the article for your information. Screw implantation in the spinous process, spinal laminar and laminar screws, these were described. So in case of high riding vertebral artery, you can use spinous process and spinal laminar and laminar screws. So this was the screw that we described long time ago, about 20 years ago, I discussed this technique. Of course, when there is high riding vertebral artery, you can use this intra-articular implants as a standalone technique. I don't use it too often, this kind of standalone, but when there is a high riding vertebral artery, you cannot, one side I have done, but the other side I have introduced this. So in case of high riding vertebral artery, you can do such techniques. C1 screw can sometimes be a problem and you can do introduce C1 screw in a transcranial fashion. And this is also a possibility. You see, this is high riding. And I never do, even if there's assimilation of atlas, I never, never include the occipital bone in my fixation construct. I sometimes drill this to get the screw here. And you see, this is C1 screw after transcranial exposure of the C1. This is another case of very high riding my screw after drill, after removal, I introduce the screw like this. You can see transcranial is a wonderful technique on some occasions. This is another very complex situation. The screw has been in, inserted in a transcranial fashion. So there is vertical, vertical dislocation. You see in extension, it comes down in flexion, it goes up. So this is a vertical dislocation, vertical mobile dislocation. We described this entity in the year 2009. Bifid, there is when there is bifid, anterior and posterior are always together. There can be lateral dislocation of the facets. So we describe that the bifid is always associated with dynamic mob, mobile. You see, when you do flexion, it goes out. When you do extension, it comes in. So this is a dynamic process. And the, you see the facets are laterally located in bifid. And also when there's a, a fracture, the facet can go lateral. So this is a lateral dislocation. Most important is the rotatory dislocation. There was no treatment described for rotatory dislocation for several years. I described 14 cases in the year 2011. I was doing for a long period of time, open the joint, man, manipulate the facet, open the, and manual manipulation of the facet and you can reduce in a very beautiful manner. Now I have got several cases and I have never, never done transoral or any anterior release or any of those kind of operation to release and bring the head in the normal situation. Reduction of atlanto axial. See, there was before there was a fixed atlanto axial dislocation was a common entity. So in we introduce a concept that there is nothing like fixed. You can reduce all the dislocation. I think this was a revolution in the craniovertebral junction. These kind of cases were always done transoral. So we 
move, open the joint, mobilize the facet and reduce the dislocation and then fix. Now I have got several hundred cases of these kind of dislocation, no decompression from front, no decompression from behind, never, never decompression. So we had divided basilar invagination into two types in the year 1998, odontoid going up, tonsil coming down. We described transoral decompression for this, forum and magnum decompression for this, but as we went further and we had introduced several parameters to, to monitor the cranio vertebral junction, we introduced this technique of basilar invagination. As you know, many of you are in cranio vertebral junction, so all of you know the implication of this article. This was complete revolution for the first time we described that basilar invagination can be re reduced first time we described that there is no need for decompression and there can be craniovertebral junction realignment. So this is basilar invagination. There's no need to do anterior decompression, posterior decompression. You can realign by introduction of intra-articular spacers and facet distraction as a treatment completely, completely revolutionize the treatment of basilar invagination. All of you who are sitting here know it. So this was my first case in the year 2000. Means 20 years ago, <clears throat> I did this distraction, reduction and fixation and realignment of the craniovertebral junction. We were the first ones to describe occipital screws. And this was my implant, which we described in the year 1987. But now this, uh, this editorial I wrote, I, whether occipital cervical fixation is necessary, I say occipital inclusion of the occipital bone is an absolutely non-essential item in this field. It is a suboptimal fixation. Don't do it. At plantoaxial fixation is the treatment. Other beautiful thing that we describe in long-standing at plantoaxial instability, torticolis, short neck, clipal file abnormality, platybasia, bone fusions are all secondary to atlantoaxial instability. They are all protective. And you do atlantoaxial fixation, there is reversal in the evening of operation. The neck can become, there is no osteotomy. Only open the joint, introduce bone graft and do solid atlantoaxial fixation. So these, all these anomalies, musculoskeletal abnormalities, of which we call, I call them alterations, are secondary and protective. And we have to understand the nature's reparative games in the chronic atlantoaxial instability. Another very fantastic article which completely revolutionized the treatment of syringomyelia was the thought that, that syringomyelia is helpful and not harmful. It is, it is a natural protective phenomenon. Cervical fusions that we see are not embryological dysgenesis or embryological abnormalities, but they are protective and in response to atlantoaxial instability. So these kind of multi-level bone fusions are not embryological problems, but they indicate that there is atlantoaxial instability, even when there is no compression. Bifid, atlant bifid C1 is an indicator of atlantoaxial instability, and you need to do atlantoaxial stabilization. Os odontoidium, I recently discussed my experience of only 20 years. My, I have done several cases before this, so 2000 to 2018, I collected 190 cases. All cases were treated by atlantoaxial fixation, no occipital fixation, no transoral decompression, no posterior decompression. And if you read my article, 100% successful clinical outcome. You see there's atlantoaxial instability and Oscar will like to see this outcome of these patients only atlantoaxial fixation, open the joint, introduce bone graft in the facet articulation and do atlantoaxial fixation. And as I mentioned to you, I have got a very, very big experience and I have no confusion, no confusion. If somebody argues with me about decompression, I think I will not like to do any decompression. Another beautiful, beautiful thing that we recently introduced is the concept of central or axial atlantoaxial instability. And this central understanding of this central instability can 
certainly, certainly expand the horizons of craniovertebral junction surgery. So this was the first dislocation that we described as lumbosacral listhesis, C1 over C2 listhesis for basal invagination, and of course, reduction, realignment is the treatment. The second more beautiful thing that we recently described is such basal invagination. You see, the whole world will still do foramen magnum decompression, and maybe some people do syringostomy, but there is a facetal malalignment and atlantoaxial fixation is necessary. And the only treatment, no decompression, even when the facets are in alignment, you have to do the presence of carry and syrinx are indicators of atlantoaxial instability and atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. I know many experts and many craniovertebral junction experts are sitting in the audience. And I wish that you please take this message home and follow this treatment, which is a revolution in the field of craniovertebral junction. So basilar invagination is always associated with instability. All kinds of basilar invagination need stabilization. And these two articles of mine, you will like to read and group A basilar, group B basilar, all treated by plantoaxial fixation, according to me. And I have no hesitation to say, I saw many people presenting, Louis presenting, Zan presenting on decompression from front, and I have completely, completely abandoned this technique. And my feeling is this is a completely historical operation. So in carry malformation, I have this paper, of course you have, all of you who are interested in craniovertebral junction have read this article, atlantoaxial instability is the cause of KRE malformation and atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment. No question about it, no question. You please don't try to argue with me why this, why this, I do decompression. You please, please try to read this concept in a more beautiful manner. Decompression of various kinds have been described all over the world. My answer to your question is carry malformation and syringomyelia, atlantoaxial instability is the cause, stabilization is the treatment, and the patient will get a new life, new life in the evening of operation. All his symptoms will disappear. Don't do decompression. Don't waste your time in all kinds of unnecessary operation. Carry malformation is a secondary to atlantoaxial instability, it is a protective maneuvering by the body. Even when the facets are in alignment, presence of carry malformation is an indicator of an unstable joint. There is no tight posterior fossa, no decompression is required. Atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. And I have now got hundreds of these cases where, and I have got more than 300 fellows from all over the world coming and seeing about carry malformation and there is no question and no doubt please don't discuss this even in your own mind when you see carry when you see syrinx you do atlantoaxial stabilization we have to learn this technique of atlantoaxial stabilization because we are in the business of craniovertebral junction Others will not understand. Those who have, you know, those who are in the audience today, I know they are interested in craniovertebral junction. They are interested in atlantoaxial joint fixation. You know how to do fixation. For carry, you do this fixation and you will do a magic treatment. Foramen magnum decompression, can it become historical? Absolutely. And this is the message I want to give you that this operation of anterior decompression, posterior decompression, both are completely historical. Please abandon them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atul. Very, very insightful um, presentation. Um, we are now open to, to, to questions. Uh, does anybody have has a question for Atul? Uh, there is a question here from, from Andres Kambalia from CSRS board, Europe. Do you continue using your plate and screws instead of polyaxial screws? Yes. You see, polyaxial screws are also possible. It is just the different type of screws, nothing else. But my plate, you see my plate, when I tighten on the plate, I can tighten it right on the facet. You, you, did you get my point? Yes. And I'm very happy and it is, gives you a biomechanical advantage. 
in some situations, very rare situations, I still you I sometimes use polyaxial, but that is an absolutely rare situation. I do plate and screw fixation because this has a biomechanical advantage. And also I always open the joint. I always open the facetal articulation. So everything is under vision, whatever I do. I never do this screw fixation blindly. I never introduce just by feeling, yeah, this may be the bone, this may be the bone. I never do this even in the most complex type of situation. And as you know, now my experience is nearing 2,750 cases, most complex kind of cases. So I have got the advantage of the numbers and I have got the advantage of the years. I am doing this operation for about 33 years. So I'm very familiar with the anatomy, but I must still say, even if I am familiar, there are many times when I get breathless during the operation due to the bleeding, due to the difficult anatomy, but I will never resort to occipital fixation. For last 15 to 20 years, I don't do occipital fixation. You can do, and I want to give this message to all the young people in the audience, that occipital fixation, that is a suboptimal kind of fixation. You do subaxial fixation, C3, C4, that loosens your implant. That is a sure shot invitation to trouble in the future. Rely on C1 facet, which is a strong facet. Do give, introduce a long screw in the C1 facet. Do the dissection. Do a difficult dissection, but do it. That's all. I got another question. Recently, I, I revised the paper on finite element analysis for, uh, for atlas dissimulation. And according to the conclusions of that study, uh, it showed that there is always some elements of uh, occipital atlantal uh, uh, instability. So would you consider for, for atlas assimilation some sort of uh, C0 fixation? Okay, so this is a very wonderful question, Oscar. Let me answer it properly, okay? Take See, your time. When, <laughs> when there is occipital fix, this is the question that is repeatedly asked to me. See, when there is assimilation of atlas with the condyle, so it becomes one. So it is a, you know, it becomes double, it becomes solid. And you can introduce your very strong screw in that solid C1 and condyle. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the other hand, occipital squama is a very, you know, you introduce, you introduce a long rod or long plate or whatever you introduce in the occipital squama and you give your theory as Zan was saying, I do anterior reduction and then inferior and that kind of picture that he was showing. Zan, this is not required. This is not required. The inclusion of the occipital bone and maneuvering of the fast and the maneuvering of the patient's head during operation is not required open the joint, distract the facet, and you get a good reduction, even if your reduction is not 100%. Your solidity of your fixation is what is important. And that concept has to be understood, has to be understood very clearly. Occipital atlantal, Oscar, listen for you, Oscar. Occipital atlantal instability is an extremely, extremely rare situation. Ox I have, when I say I have done 2,750 operations by C1, C2, I have not done a single case where there was occipital atlantal instability. In some syndromic children, there can be occipital atlantal instability, but even in syndromic children, atlantoaxial instability is common, not occipital atlantal. So inclusion of occipital bone is a suboptimal operation. We are trying to run away from the situation and doing a suboptimal operation. It is better to learn how to expose the C1 facet. It is better to learn the anatomy of the area, dissect in a bloody field because you know the venous complex can be quite tricky in this situation. If you are having problem, you do C2 ganglion resection and then expose the region. Your exposure has to be panoramic if you have to do the fixation. As I mentioned, in some difficult situation, I even go transcranial to get to the C1, but that is the way I do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bernard, go ahead. Il n'a pas le micro, oh, microphone. Oh, sorry. 
Okay, I got the microphone. I hate screws and plate and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I am not an orthopedic surgeon. This is what I say. I want to say. Bernard, uh, Bernard, let me let me answer that first. Just you know what? <laughs> in the year 1987, Oscar, in 1987, the screws were just introduced when we introduced C1 screw. Lumber screws were introduced at that time, in 1986-87. Lumber screws, lumber pedicular screws were introduced at that time. And we, we, you know, we took that idea from the lumber screws and then, and I am a neurosurgeon. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. No. And, we got, and we got this idea with my orthopedic colleague who was my partner for a long time. And we did it together on the cadavers like you. Uh, Bernard, we you, we have done dissection courses together. Nobody no. can do anything without dissection. Nobody can do anything without going to the cadaver lab. You know it, and you have taught in various cadaver dissection. Uh, Bernard, we have been together on several courses. What do you have to say, Bernard? Tell me. I, I want to discuss about the Chiari and Sirango Sir yeah, What yeah. I think that instead of screwing things, is just <laughs> put the bone and split the dura. I don't open the dura. I split the dura to make it very thin. I learned that from a Japanese guy. So it's a very simple operation. No uh, foreign material with the risk of infection that may happen sometimes with some risk of, uh, and not for you, you are too experienced. But, but for me, this is a more simple, simpler technique for carry malformation Okay, Bernard, Bernard, now you listen, my friend Bernard. Yeah. You know what? In 1998, I described that you should not open the dura when you do foramen magnum decompression for Chiari. I described in 1988. But then now I have got, you know, I have got this revolution. Bernard, you are, you know, you, you listen. Revolution in Chiari malformation that you do not need foramen magnum decompression. This is a revolution in the field of Chiari malformation. You do atlant, this is a secondary issue. Atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment. And Bernard, you have never seen magic in your life. I will show you magic. You are still, I know you have retired from neurosurgery for some time, but you are, your brain is still active, I know it. Why don't you come and spend some days with me, Bernard? Don't no. worry. <laughs> but I, but I, I reinforce what I said. You must split the dura. If you no, do, no, no you need know. to dura. No, no need to touch I, the dura. <laughs> just open the bone, split the dura, and then the next days, the next days, the syringum area has disappeared. Okay, and guys. I, I, I think. We, we need a webinar. We need a okay. webinar just for Chiari malformation. Philippe, okay. Philippe do, do you have a, any comments? Please. I know this is very interesting, but I have to recognize that uh, uh, Mr. Gold uh, uh, talked about instability, and my boss, Jean Dubousset, talked about instability too, and uh, he, he, he wanted to stabilize Chiari uh, against the neurosurgeon. So, you know, the, the term of stability and stability is a long, long story. So, uh, you know, guys, uh, uh, I agree with uh, Bernard because we learn a lot from Bernard in Saint Vincent Paul. He operated a lot of patients. And uh, I agree too with uh, the Professor Gold about instability. So, guys, it was really nice to hear you guys. Sorry. Fantastic. Yeah, you are very impressive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any, any, any other comment, uh, Luis? You you want to say something? I I need to invite everybody to participate in December, in the beginning, in pre meeting course in Rio de Janeiro. There is a pre meeting from the school base 2020 about. Uh, cranial vertebral junction and cervical spine. I hope that that time uh, the, the corona care is going to go out and you have the Congress. Professor Goa was one of the guests invited by us and in the name of the 
Brazilian Spine Cranial Vertebral Junction Committee that we have here the Professor Geraldo Carneiro. We are together organizing this pre-meeting course. Dr. Geraldo can give some, some words for inviting everybody also. I'm, I'm trying to give the microphone to Geraldo for a while now, but I don't know why I can't do I, I Geraldo, yes, please. Geraldo? Uh, 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 Professor Guo, I have a... Yeah. Uh, yeah, how are a, you? First, how are you? Are you fine? <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> I have, I have two, two questions for you. Yeah. In, in case of uh, ano uh, severe anomalous uh, vertebral artery in situ, Mm. What do you think about uh, fusion C1 translaminar or, or C1 C3? Yeah, I was just talking about it. You know, sometimes in very high vertebral artery, I drill and expose and mobilize the artery. That is one recent thing that I'm doing. But you can use the inferior facet of C2 inferior facet of C2 to introduce, or you mm -hmm. can do translaminar screw. There are various options in that situation, as you know, as you are a senior experience in this field. And you are my old okay. friend, my dear friend. Nice to see you. Right. <laughs> nice to see you too. Uh, thank you, Oscar. I invite all, all the participants to, to the participate in December uh, and cranial vertebral junction uh, disease in a pre-congress of uh, cranial, uh, base cranial surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. Uh, Geraldo, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Oscar. So I, I, I think, Philip, we have to close here. We are approaching three hours of discussion on, on cranial vertebral yeah. junction and uh, I have to say that uh, we have never been in a session uh, so good and so uh, scientific uh, point of view, so 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 high level. So I I, I really thank everybody, Professor George, uh, Professor Goel, and uh, everybody else that has been with us. You know, June and and the guys from China and South Korea. It's very late in in morning already there. And uh, I hope to count on you for next ventures. And uh, really, thank you all. Stay, stay safe. Thank you. We would like to thank you, you guys. You organize everything. You have the idea. You, uh, everybody join us. And Oscar, you've done a huge job. And congratulations and thank you from my deep heart. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you, guys. Oscar. Bye thank bye. you. So bye bye. Bye bye, Oscar. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Zan. Zan. Bye bye, Luis. <laughs> bye, Professor Goyo. Bye, Zen. John. Thank you. Oscar. Bernard. Philip. John Bene. Yeah. Thank you very Dr. much. <laughs> look, forward, look forward to the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See you guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye.